Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we are now going to study variogram model fitting. So the idea in variogram model fitting is to search for a valid variogram that is closest to the spatial dependence in a given sample data set. So what we have to start with is really a given sample data set. So let's do that. So, so we represent our sample data as a vector z which is equal to z at location s1, z at location s2, z at location s3, keep going uh, to z at location sn, right, where location you know points s1, s2 till sn are my uh, you know spatial entities at which I have sampled the data. Everywhere else, I have not sampled the data. Okay, so uh, 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 now you know. So this vector is all these values contained in this uh, you know uh, in row vector transposed. That means that z by itself is a column vector. So it is a vector of size n by one. That is to say that z is really. Uh, looks like an Excel, an, uh, you know, a column of an, in an Excel sheet where you have values spread out as, uh, you know, uh, uh, along the cells in a column, right? So this is just to give you an idea of vector notation, which is not really uh, very difficult, right? So next, uh, you know, let us consider. Let us consider. Uh, the family, the family of isotropic linear variograms, right? So we are working with isotropic linear variograms. That means that you know my lag vector h is diverse only to the extent of distance that it represents in each direction the data that I am working with is going to exhibit the same spatial properties, right? If the data were anisotropic, then direction 2 would have become as important as distance, right? So then I, if I were to do a north-south, you know, lag of 100 meters, it will not give me the same spatial dependence structure as the east-west, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, lag uh, of 100 meters. Right? In our case, when we study isotropic, you know, direction really becomes, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, a uniform uh, uh, representation of the process, uh, you know, in all directions. Right? So, so direction is not really the entity of of lag; it's really just the distance, it's just to make my own life easier, and also to restrict ourselves to the scope of this course. Right? We are not working with an isotropic data so far, as this course is com concerned. Okay. So we have seen this. We have seen this family uh, previously. It's called two gamma such that gamma h is equal to c zero plus b h such that c zero is greater than or equal to zero and b is greater than or equal to zero. With this family of linear variograms, our aim is to choose from uh, the above family, above family or set of variograms, the parametric model, model that is closest to the real world situation or that is closest to the data that we have. 
that is we want a, the set P of 2 gamma such that 2 gamma H equals 2 gamma H and theta right and this theta lies in a definitive parametric space it is just the space in which theta can move right theta cannot be arbitrarily anywhere it is supposed to be lying within a given uh, you know set uh, uh, you know this capital theta okay. Um, so, from for the linear radiogram this theta is really a vector by itself which contains c 0 and b and ultimately uh, the problem boils down to to ch choosing parameters c 0 and b c 0 and b such that uh, you know uh, 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 2 gamma h theta fits right fits well to the given sample data set. Okay. Uh, now, you know we need to understand what does it mean uh, you know uh, 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 and what will it take to fit a good uh, you know model to the given data set right. Um, so, for fitting for fitting the best model for fitting the best model on a variogram cloud remember we always have this cloud from the experimental radiogram right and we are trying to fit a model onto it we will need a an assumption on the distribution of spatial data right so as statisticians, we view the world as a sequence of random processes. As spatial statisticians, we view the world as a sequence of random processes in, in space, right. So, we need an assumption on the distribution, right. I mean, so, so random processes will have specific distributions and we need to specify a distribution. So, that what we need is for these values z, we need to be able to specify a CDF from which these values are being drawn. Not only that, that this CDF representation f of z will also provide us a, uh, a, a, a property of how the values are connected in space, right, in a modeled sense. Usually, right, f z is assumed to be Gaussian. What does it mean when I say f is assumed to be Gaussian? That is, it is usually assumed to be normally, normally distributed, uh, you know, uh, a random variable or a random function. Why? Well, because as we will see, it allows us to specify a nugget effect, right? We have seen that, you know, the nugget effect is usually uh, considered white noise and that is why a Gaussian uh, you know assumption on f of z will allow us to uh, you know uh, specify a nugget effect which is then very important in order to estimate an unbiased variogram which then allows us to estimate estimate an unbiased variogram okay and the second thing that we will be needing in order to fit this best model is a goodness of fit criteria i need a judgment device in order to figure out 
what is a best model or what is a better model relative to an alternative. Right, so we need a criteria. In case of regressions, if you, uh, if uh, I, I hope most of you have seen a regression model, uh, even if you have not, I'm sure you must be aware of this statistic called R squared. R squared is a goodness of fit criteria, right? There are multiple alternative goodness of fit criteria out there. We will need such a criteria in order to figure out what is the best, uh, you know, um, model uh, variogram for the real world, okay? So we will now go over each algorithm that we have, we had introduced. So the first one was called as the maximum likelihood estimation, okay? Uh, maximum uh, likelihood estimation relies crucially, crucially on the Gaussian assumption. on f of z, okay? Um, now, the process of maximum likelihood estimation aims to recover a parametric, uh, you know, a uh, 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 variogram model by exploiting the variance covariance matrix of, you know, data in a spatial domain, right? So, let us write that down. The process of MLE MLE, which is an acronym for maximum likelihood estimation. The process of MLE aims to exploit or use, uh, you know, recover a variance, covariance uh, matrix or structure of a spatial data set. Um, in order to provide an estimate of the variogram. Okay. Now, to see this process, to see this process, let us begin with, let us begin with a case where the, the data are independent. So, with a no spatial dependence case. Right? So, we will start with a case which is simplistic, right? which will have no spatial dependence. So, we will conduct MLE on it and then we will introduce spatial dependence to the structure. And then we will see how you know, MLE will work in order to provide me an estimate of the parameter vector theta and hence a parameter model, uh, variogram model, uh, you know, uh, 2 gamma h theta, okay? So, we are given a sequence of data. What is the sequence of data? It is z1, z2, z3, keep going all the way till z n, okay? We define this as a vector z, okay? Again, the, the, data, the, the, the data vector is a column vector, so it is a n by n by 1 vector, right? So, it is like you can imagine an Excel sheet and a, and a column of cells where these data are recorded, okay? Uh, now, Remember, we are given a sequence of data. We have said that in order to do any analysis in maximum likelihood, we need the Gaussian assumption, right? So, it is the first crucial assumption that I must take. That is, we are going to say zi are iid, that is independently and identically distributed as normal mu comma sigma squared. So, they are normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared, right? Um, now, in this formulation, I am going to do a little aside. I am going to do a little aside. 
you know I could set you know if I set mu as let us say x i beta where x i is a vector of size 1 by k and beta is a vector of parameter k by 1 right. That is all I am writing here is beta 1 x 1 i plus beta 2 x 2 i plus beta k x k i. Then I am basically providing a setting which looks like a regression model right. So, then this setting then this setting would resemble would resemble uh, the MLE or the maximum likelihood estimation of the following regression model that is z i equals beta 1 x 1 i beta 2 x 2 i beta 3 x 3 i plus u i. Okay. So, in this regression model I have a systemic portion a systemic component. The systemic component is the one which can provide you a systematic you know how is the variation in z i explained by systematic factors x 1 till x k. If z i were ground water data x 1 might be rainfall, x 2 might be the amount of discharge, x 3 might be something like industrial demand, uh, you know uh, 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 x 4 might be something like policy groundwater management policy which restricts the let us say number of electricity hours on a farm which draws groundwater and so on and so forth. It could be price of water, it could be alternative sources of water, it could be aquifer properties and so on and so forth. These are observed physical and social and economic factors around us that can explain how groundwater values would actually evolve over time or over space, right. These systemic components provide me a, a, a you know a, 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 a portion of the variation in z i that I as an analyst can explain by choosing x i's and then estimating betas in a linear coefficient form attached to each x i, right. However, groundwater values are likely to be more complex in the way they evolve over space that is how they change by i. The fact the portion of variation in z i's over space that I cannot explain is, is, is captured in this residual or error component. This is the component of uh, you know of, 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 of groundwater variation that I as an analyst cannot explain through this model, right. The model is linear, it is restrictive, it could be highly nonlinear, right. One of the x i's x, uh, x k's could be squared or they could be I could include them in square root. I could even multiply x 2 and x 3 and include that as a separate variable. I do not do any of that, it is a simplistic model. Again, it is a model, it is a represent imperfect representation of the real world, but it provides me with a lot of information uh, which is generalizable across space, right. Um, because it is an imperfect representation, there is a component which remains uh, you know uh, uh, as an error component and rather it is a random error component. Okay. If I were to instead of mu, if I were to say z i is i i d n x i beta, I am basically talking about a regression model, right. So, we will work with the sequence such that it is mean is just mu, but you should be aware that we could just simply extend this formulation to a regression framework. Okay. So, given, given coming back to our problem that z i is i i d n mu comma sigma squared. Um, the likelihood or probability the likelihood of observing 
z i in the given sample is given as f that is the pdf of z i this is the continuous pdf representation and the parameters mu and sigma squared this f value is given as 1 over square root 2 pi sigma squared exponential minus half z i minus mu over sigma the whole squared. The right hand side mathematical formulation comes from the specification of a normal distribution. It represents a normal distribution. But given the value of z i, once I know my z i value, I can actually back out the probability or the propensity of observing this value in my sample. What is the you know uh, a chance that I will observe let us say z i equals 5 given parameters mu and sigma squared right. This functional form will provide me that chance of observing each z i ok. Uh, now after having learnt the probability of observing a particular you know z i, I want to now figure out the likelihood or probability of observing the entire sample ok. So, if I have the probability of observing one z i, one of the z i's, what is the probability of observing all the z i's at once right, basically the sequence z 1, z 2 through z n. Remember each z i that is z 1, z 2 is simply a random draw from this normal distribution. So, the, the fact that I have a particular sequence of n values itself is a instance of chance right and I am trying to figure out what is the probability of observing the sample itself given that each z i is i i d uh, normal mu comma sigma squared. So, what I am after is f of z 1, z 2, z 3 all the way till z n. I am looking for the probability of the sequence of data given mu and sigma squared right. Remember I had said that these z, these z uh, values put in a column vector can be defined as a vector z of size n by 1. This z is going to be distributed according to a multivariate normal of size mu and sigma squared. Now, because I have a z vector of different z i's, each z i has an attached mean mu to it. So, n by 1 vector of z's will have a mean n by 1 attached to it. For variance, a n by 1 vector will have a variance covariance matrix of size n by n, right. So, then sigma squared which is a scalar is not enough, I need an identity matrix to be attached to it which is let us say sigma squared i n. I should be working with, uh, I should be working with smaller uh, you know uh, n values. So, let me just make that correction in a minute n by 1, uh, n by 1 and then n by n by multiplying sigma squared by a you know identity matrix. By doing that what I have really done is what I am saying is that the, the column vector z 1, z 2, z 3 all the way to z n is distributed normal according to uh, you know with a mean vector of mu, mu, mu of size n by 1 and a matrix n by n matrix having the you know uh, 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 the diagonal values being sigma squared and off diagonal values being 0 basically suggesting that the covariance between any of the z i's is 0 which makes sense because you are working with no spatial dependence, no dependence in data. We are working with identically and independently observed data. 
So off diagonal elements will be zero. When we introduce spatial dependence to the data, we are going to exactly going to change the fact that the variance covariance, uh, you know, that is the off diagonal elements of this covariance covariance matrix is no longer going to be zero. Okay, so I have a n by one vector normally distributed i i d with n by one mean vector and a n by n variance covariance matrix where the off diagonal elements are zero because I am working with the i i d which is independently drawn distributions from the same distrib uh, you know uh, which is the same distribution normal with the same mean and a variance sigma squared across all z i's. Now when I write this when I get back to my problem that I am trying to solve is that I have to figure out what is the I know f z i I want f of z vector which is all the values in my uh, data sequence. This is going to be given as mu comma sigma squared i n is equal to f of observing the first z1 times observing z1 conditional on observe sorry observing z2 conditional on the fact that I have observed z1 times I have the, the, pro the probability of observing z3 conditional on the fact that I have observed z2 and z1 keep going all the way till observing zn conditional on the fact that I have observed zn minus 1, zn minus 2 all the way till z1. Okay? Now the fact that we have an IID assumption, the fact that we have an IID assumption, so given the IID assumption what happens is that the conditional density is equal to the marginal density. That is the, the probability of observing z2 does not depend on what z1 was or the, the probability of observing zn does not depend on what happened earlier uh, in when, when we draw you know uh, 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 z1, z2 all the way till zn minus 1 it is independent of what is happening before or after it. That is not going to be the case if we had spatial dependence in data. But with the IID assumption we can write f of z mu comma sigma squared i n equals f of z1 times f of z2 times f of z3 times f of z4 times keep going till f of zn. That is we have a multiplicative you know representation i goes from 1 to n f of z i which is to say we have multiplication of i goes from 1 to n 1 over square root 2 pi sigma squared exponential uh, 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 minus half z i minus mu over sigma the whole squared and this f of z i I am sourcing directly from what I have you know presented earlier. If I were to solve this I am simply going to get uh, I am going to multiply each component n times. So, I am going to get 1 over 2 pi sigma square to the power n over 2 times exponential. So, you have exponentials e to the power you know uh, this stuff being multiplied for each z i. So, I am going to write this is going to be minus half summation i goes 1 to n z i minus mu by sigma the whole squared. Let us take it to the next page. So, we have the likelihood of observing our sample given z i are i i d normal 0 comma sigma squared being given as f f of z vector which is a n by 1 vector given mu and sigma squared equal to 1 over 2 pi sigma squared to the power n by 2 exponential 
summation okay, minus half i equals 1 to n z i minus mu sigma the whole squared. All right. Now, with that you know we take a log of this and that is called as the log likelihood. So, the log likelihood of observing the given sample So, I can call this f, I can define this as L of uh, you know mu and sigma squared, the two parameters that I am after. Log likelihood of this is going to be L and L mu comma sigma squared equals uh, minus n by 2 log of 2 pi minus n by 2 log of sigma squared minus 1 over 2 sigma squared summation i equals 1 to n z i minus mu the whole squared. Now, my objective is to maximize. So, my algorithm is called maximum likelihood estimation. I have the likelihood of observing the sample. The next step is to maximize the likelihood of observing this sample. So, so I am just going by the nomenclature, I am going to maximize this and when I maximize this, my choice variables are mu and sigma squared. So, these are my variables that I can choose. I have a degree of freedom what mu and sigma squared value could, values could be. right? So, I could choose mu and sigma squared such that the likelihood of observing this given sample, the sequence z1 till zn is maximized given, given that zi's are iid normally distributed with parameters mu and sigma squared. So, it is a this is a uh, this is an optimization problem and when we face such an optimization problem we write our first order conditions. Okay. So, our first order conditions will be del l and l by del mu that is the, the first differential uh, partial differential by our first choice variable this will be set equal to 0, then del n l, l n l by del sigma squared that is our second choice variable, this will be set equal to 0. Overall, I have two equations and two unknowns. Okay? So, I can solve this. When I actually solve this, we will find that mu hat m l that is the maximum likelihood estimator for mu will come out to be z bar which is nothing but the sample mean of all the z i's. Whereas, sigma hat squared m l which is where the hat means it is a data driven estimate and m l means it is a maximum likelihood data driven estimate. That is going to be come out to be summation i equals 1 to n z i minus mu hat m l which is nothing but the z bar value divided by n. Okay? Now, these are my maximum likelihood estimators, maximum likelihood estimators estimators without spatial dependence. Okay. So, as a next step, as a next natural step what we are going to do is that we are going to add spatial dependence to these data and see how what happens and how these uh, you know uh, 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 parameter estimates change, what changes when we add spatial dependence to the data. Clearly, the first thing that is going to happen is that I am not going to have sigma squared i n as my variance covariance matrix. right? my variance covariance matrix will be more complicated because my off diagonal elements are going to be non zero so the first change that you are going to observe is at the uh, you know uh, 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 the uh, off diagonal elements of the variance covariance matrix of this vector okay so let's move forward and do that mm -hmm.